Okay, hello everyone. The time is right to start. Uh, welcome to our very special session today. Uh, we will talk about that, what we live actually. So the role of network governance and circular economy hubs. And we are super privileged also of uh, having Professor Jacqueline Kramer with us. Uh, we will refer to her later on. I will just take uh, a few notes at the very beginning. So like a household rules, as you know. So uh, warm welcome, please switch off the cameras and switch off the mics as long as you are not the one who is speaking. That is rule number one. Rule number two, stay active, listen carefully and uh, there is a chat. So please uh, share your questions or uh, ideas with us. And the third very important thing is that this event is only one stop on our very interesting journey of the creation of the document that refers to the role of network governance and of the hubs. So today we have this circular economy talk that will take two hours and we will be as vivid as possible, we promise you. Uh, and then you have uh, social media, so the LinkedIn group, uh, and you can post whatever you find relevant, you can share information and so on. And of course, we are inviting you, the hubs uh, and the individuals who are working on the, in the field of network governance, really to share with us your ideas and your proposals, what to integrate into the final document that is going to be published then until the end of the year and in March. Uh, we are going to be present with our leadership group also at the annual conference of the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform that is hopefully going to take place in a live or at least hybrid version on the 1st and the 2nd of March. So this is our journey starting officially today and then uh, we will continue and uh, introduce everything in March. So what is the aim of this event actually? As I said at the very beginning, uh, we are the network of networks, European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform, and we are really proud of the work and of the impact that we have on the ground. And one of uh, important facts is also that uh, right now or, or just today, also the European Circular Economy Week started and we are part of that as well since our partners in Poland, in Polish Hub, uh, is, uh, are leading that special week as well. So here you can already see how connected we are and how collaboration work in practice. So what is our added value? Our added value is that we are working on the ground and we really have an insight into that who is doing what we are not only on the city level or national level, but also on the international level and we can contribute to new relations, to new value chains, to new collaborations that have great impact. Today, as I already said, we are very privileged and proud that we have Professor Jacqueline Kramer with us, uh, who is somehow uh, introducing the findings of her uh, survey that she did for the very first time on that, how transition brokers are operating in different contexts in different countries, as well as on that, how network governance is mature in different countries. So more on that with my co-host today, and I must say that that without him, this platform and even our role wouldn't be what it is. This is Frick van Eyck from Holland Circular Hotspot. So Frick, hello, without you, we are half lost. So thank you for, for being here and for joining uh, us and for leading this uh, discussion through the day. And just to conclude, before we jump into the program, uh, I would like to say that uh, in this uh, mandate, as well as in the previous mandates of being the chair and the co-chair now with Frick, uh, I have learned that we are really a strong network, impactful network, and established by uh, the European Commission, as well as by European Economic and Social Committee, we really are like the child these parents can be proud of because we proved in these years that there is a lot happening. There are a lot not only of initiatives, but also of projects that wouldn't happen without the existence of the hubs and of this very important network. So we are definitely meaningful, 
purposeful and powerful partner for the Commission as well as for European Economic and Social Committee. So at this point, I would give the word to someone who has a lot, uh, who, who should be called a kind of a father also of this platform. This is Kilian Lorne, Vice President of the European Economic and Social Committee, uh, who, whose heart is beating for the platform no matter what position he has. And uh, I'm really happy, Kilian, that you are today with us proving that even even within your fully booked schedule, you always find time for our platform. So please, uh, the floor or the screen is yours, and uh, we are looking forward to the message you have to deliver. Thanks, Ladea. Um, by now, you think I would be very slick at, at pressing the right button to turn on the microphone and not turn off my camera instead, but... Um, uh, but I'm not, of course. <laughs> uh, thank you for that introduction. And yes, my heart has been beating for the circular economy for a number of years now, um, sometimes in a healthy way and sometimes in a very stressful way, because this has been such a such a journey and such a, a huge challenge and um, a transition that's happening quickly within many sectors and of course needs to happen on a much broader scale and I guess that's part of of what we want to discuss today um, and part of what I, I look forward to hearing from you uh, throughout uh, this morning's circular talk. It's more than five years ago now since the launch of the 2015 Circular Economy Action Plan and as Ludea just said, the EESC and the Commission came together to create a platform for stakeholders. I was very pleased to be rapporteur for the opinion, the piece of work that the ESE was doing and to put forward this proposal to have a platform. And to my delight and, and surprise, the platform has gone on to deliver four very high profile annual conferences. Uh, we have a coordination group, as, as you see in the graphic there, that has delivered more than 50 different initiatives. Um, and of course, we established a website that's had more than 350,000 visitors and brought together over 2,000 good practices, uh, strategies and publications on the Knowledge Hub. So the platform um, has created a social media network of more than 5,000 Twitter followers and nearly 3,000 followers on LinkedIn. So I know those figures uh, can can be either very heavy or cause people to switch off and, and seem meaningless. But the point is that this platform has helped us to reach a very uh, wide and varied network. So what precisely did we set out to do with it when it was launched in, in March 2017? Well, the first thing we did was to put the spotlight back on to the stakeholders. Um, to invite them to the first conference and ask all of you what your expectations and what your needs were of such a platform. And as a result, the platform's mandate was established based on, on that feedback. So, so far we've looked at the, the broad objective of advancing the circular economy concept within member states, within regions and local governments, within civil society and businesses, and link all of them to the global dimension. The second focus was to strengthen cooperation. We know that this is key for a well-functioning network to have stakeholders and networks of stakeholders and as you just heard to create a network of networks to facilitate the exchange of expertise and good practices and also the more difficult um, exchange which is exchanging where things do not work or where things do not function so well and the lessons that we learn from from those valuable experiences and that's linked to the, the third objective in this mandate, which was to contribute to identifying social, economic and cultural barriers to the transition to a circular economy. So in practice, putting those together has meant we've created this one stop shop for the circular economy in Europe. It's become the reference point for international institutions aiming to support the transition in their own way to the circular economy and with the European institutions such as ourselves providing the support structure and the space for the stakeholders, the platform seeks to link circular economy policy to circular economy practice. So seeking to link 
uh, Brussels, which can sometimes seem removed, linking it back to the cities, the regions, the factories, the consumers who are active on the ground. And that's, as Ladea said, where the added value is for this. We can showcase good practices and lessons learned and therefore help inspire people along the journey towards what could be a truly circular economy. So through the EESC, European civil society has shown how collaboration is key. Um, it's key for a successful uh, and effective transition. And stakeholders from across the continent, from different sectors, from researchers, consumers, industry, trade unionists, um, environmentalists like myself, and stakeholders from national, regional and local levels, all working together with one goal in mind. And that's a, a, a very European approach um, and has proven to be a very successful report, re approach. Transitioning to a circular economy, but this it doesn't happen on its own. And as I think we'll we'll see from Jacqueline Kramer's uh, the professor's research, governance is key to harnessing energy uh, in order to deliver results. And really, we want to be results focused and results driven. So our experience so far has shown that it starts with creating the networks and having the, the networking. However, proper governance is needed if the networks are really to power the circular economy and networks governance means building an inclusive coalition of partners, as we've seen from um, from different groups such as uh, the Yellow Jackets, the, the Gilets Jaunes from Greta Thunberg and the climate activists, and even from, from things like Brexit, when people feel they're not being listened to, their energy gets channeled into making their voices heard. And how do we harness that energy of existing and future networks to break the barrier that's keeping us at 9% at of circularity in our economy? So while we've already achieved a lot and we've, we've set these very solid uh, foundations by giving the power and the energy to the stakeholders, um, these needs are evolving and they should evolve because we should be advancing and we should have new challenges and, and new objectives. And I think this EU circular talk is precisely the pl place to start um, that com conversation. And I very much look forward to seeing what needs to change now. Wh what are the next set of challenges? What should a new mandate for a circular economy stakeholder platform be focusing on and be pushing for to amplify those voices where barriers still exist. Let's really use this opportunity we have to have the stakeholders around the table to identify what is practically needed in order to provide the adequate supports to really push this transition and go to the next level. It's growing. A lot has been done. A lot has been achieved thanks to your hard work, but we know that a lot still remains to be done. And I look forward to the rest of the morning's discussions to see how we're actually going to achieve that. Thanks very much to Lede and to Freck for, for hosting us today. And um, I'll hand the floor back to you. Thank you so much, Kilian, for these nice words. I will immediately uh, go to Frick uh, to, uh, to give him the floor and to go forward with the discussion that we are all looking for. Please, Frick. Thank you, Kilian. Thank you, Ladea. Now, our next speaker is no one less than Professor Dr. Jacqueline Kramer. And we are very privileged today because we have a unicum. We will get a global teaser of her new research work. Uh, and it's a sequel, actually, to her Dutch work on network governance. Uh, and it's a research work that's based on our collective knowledge uh, because she has interviewed 16 of us. So it's about the effectiveness of circular economy governance in international perspective. And it comes timely, I have to say. We're in the mid after COVID-19 as the whole world realizes that the only future is a circular future. And it also reminds me to say that this is a topic beyond Europe. Uh, we have to make our supply lines like circular. We have to make the world circular if we want to have a future as Europe. And, now, last week, you might know that we have new circular economy hubs in our network. A new hub saw the light in Lagos, Nigeria, but also in, uh, in Vietnam. And I think that as the network of networks, uh, we can share our insight and help them to link for while at the same time learn from them. Um, and sometimes they, they can, we can learn a lot from them. I learned a lot that from, for instance, in South Africa, they're much further with restorative uh, agriculture than we are. Well, Jacqueline has interviewed not only European hubs, 
but also I think six or so hubs outside Europe. So how can we scale up circular economy? What role can networks play? Jacqueline, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Freik. And uh, I'm very pleased to uh, present to you results of an international comparison on the governance uh, of circular economy. And I'd like uh, Ladea to uh, present my uh, slides. Yeah, we are jumping in with the slides. Here we go. Uh, um, yes, very nice. Um, so next slide, please. I um, started uh, this uh, uh, study uh, after I published this book, How Network Governance Powers the Circular Economy. And uh, based on many examples, I formulated 10 guiding principles for building a circular economy based on our Dutch experiences. And uh, everybody who is not familiar with this book, they can download it free of charge. Um, and uh, where you can download it is here on the slide. So um, I was puzzled when I uh, finished this book and also doing the work in practice in the Netherlands. How uh, can we learn from other countries and see what kind of governance fits their country? Next slide, please. So um, what I learned is that uh, in, in the Netherlands, we not only can rely upon public governance, that is the traditional uh, governance of the government, uh, putting in place policies and uh, uh, also uh, government instruments on circular economy, but to create the transition to a circular economy requires also networks uh, in practice that actually put the nice policies into practice. So I call that network governance, and it does not replace public governance, but it is actually complementary to public governance. And uh, in this way, I was thinking, how can uh, other countries learn from the Netherlands, but the other way around, how can we learn from other countries, whether public and network governance can go hand in hand. Next slide, please. So uh, the central question was, if and how can the concurrent application of both network governance and public governance lead to effective implementation of circular economy? And uh, to answer this question, I studied the current public governance of uh, 16 different countries worldwide. Uh, I studied the involvement of the relevant actors, how much are they involved, uh, uh, and also uh, which uh, of the actors is more involved. And uh, I studied the receptivity to network governance in view of the particular social, cultural and political context. And this, uh, as I said, the, the study is based on uh, 16 countries and I interviewed the uh, one or two uh, contact persons of the circular hotspot, the HEP, uh, or a comparable organization that is doing also uh, the orchestration of circular economy in their country. Next slide, please. Um, to uh, study this, I uh, asked all the interviewees uh, about the uh, governmental leadership in terms of what are the policies, the product policies, the recycling rates, the uh, incineration and landfill, and also some other uh, aspects um, to get a hold on how far are the governments in implementing the policies. And uh, I also asked the involvement and to what degree uh, industry, uh, local government, NGOs and citizens are involved. And with respect to the network governance, I asked uh, um, well questions about the receptivity of uh, uh, network governance. And uh, I will explain later on how I did that on several cultural dimen dimensions. And finally, I also asked what are the drivers additionally to uh, the, the main drivers to um, implement network governance and what are the challenges for public governance? So next slide, please. Um, 
uh, to understand the receptivity to uh, of network governance uh, i uh, relied upon the literature on social cultural dimensions and um, well uh, i expected that potentially these seven dimensions could be interesting uh, in terms of that they influence the the possibilities of implementing network governance and it turned out that the first two were most dominant. They were clearly related uh, to the interviewees uh, to network governance. So whether the society is an an antagonistic or more consensus oriented, and whether uh, the government is autocratic or pluralistic. Next slide, please. Uh, as I said, I also try to get a hold on the drivers and the challenges. Um, and uh, the drivers for network governance were, first of all, uh, was the, the, the main driver was seen as the structured, goal-oriented approach uh, uh, to implement network governance, comparable to the Dutch experiences, because everybody recognized all the different uh, guiding principles formulated in the book that I wrote. But uh, uh, on top of that, they also mentioned a number of uh, additional drivers, but they were most of the time uh, specific for their own country. And, uh, sometimes they were comparable, but uh, I made uh, these, uh, I listed these points, but it does not mean that this is a complete list. It's just to get an idea of what you can think of when you work in a hub what kind of additional drivers you can use to speed up the process. And the same holds for the challenges for public governance. Everybody immediately said, well, that's of course the implementation of adequate policies and government instruments. But yes, there are also a number of additional challenges that we can tackle and that can really help as well. So uh, I don't have to um, mention then all uh, by, uh, I, I, you can read it, but what kind of uh, examples were provided. Well, um, then next slide, please. On the basis of all this input, I made a uh, an overall scheme of what really helps uh, hubs to orchestrate the governance process. Well, uh, there you see on the left side of the slide, government leadership. Well, uh, if there is strong leadership, you can imagine it's easier also for a hub to get things off the ground. Uh, when there is weak uh, um, leadership, it, it is harder and there are less policies and practices uh, and the involvement of actors is also uh, limited. Th that makes it harder. But it can be that in a particular country, network uh, government, uh, governance is easily, uh, can easily be implemented, that the receptivity to network governance, uh, in other words, is high. So, for instance, uh, in some countries, you really see that uh, it helps when a consensus-oriented society, uh, particularly also the cooperation between government and industry, is helpful in uh, the implementation of network governance. And also a pluralistic government where uh, different views on matters uh, are allowed to be discussed also help to imp in implement um, network governance. The opposite, when uh, there is an antagonistic society uh, and there is not much cooperation and also when uh, there is uh, less um, possibility uh, because there is an autocratic government to really um, have discussions among each other about uh, how to proceed, that also makes it more difficult. Uh, if I summarize this, uh, then you think, okay, when you are have a uh, strong leadership and you have a receptivity to network governance, uh, makes it all easier and uh, that is the best condition. Yes, indeed, it's more favorable, but it does not mean that if you are not in that favorable position, that you uh, can't do a lot of things to really get things moving. Uh, and uh, the last slide uh, illustrates that there are different avenues to implement uh, a circular economy via a specific uh, kind of governance. Um, I have four different avenues. 
formulated here on the slide. Uh, the first one is the one I just said, when uh, there is a government leadership that is strong, but also a high involvement of uh, actors and network governments. governance uh, is uh, in the sense of receptivity medium to high. In, that is a favorable condition, but in these countries, like in the Netherlands, um, uh, that, that's an example, it does not mean that we don't have problems. Not at all. There are many uh, obstacles uh, that need to be tackled. Um, so uh, that's the first uh, avenue. The second avenue is when there is a, a, a limited government circular economy leadership, but a clear uh, involvement of industry and network governance is uh, also um, possible in terms of receptivity, medium high. Then uh, the starting is relatively easy because you have a lot of people who can get things moving. Uh, proactive companies uh, and also other parties can start this circular economy, but for the acceleration, you really need the support of more actors and also uh, uh, you, you need um, additional drivers to really can uh, speed up the process. And the third avenue is when there is strong government leadership, but uh, less involvement of industry and uh, not so much receptivity to network governance. Here, too, you can start as a government to implement all kinds of policies. Uh, and you can also, as a, a government, uh, take uh, uh, tackle additional um, challenges uh, that can be overcome by the government. But you uh, need for the acceleration the, the support of other actors. So you need to work on that as well. And finally, you have the situation where uh, government leadership is limited and also involvement is limited and also the uh, network governance receptivity is limited. In that case, it is, of course, the most problematic situation, but still there. And I talked to some of the people who are in, in that category. Still there, we discuss all kinds of possibilities to start uh, to, uh, the, the process because there are always first movers in industry uh, or in society society with whom you can uh, really uh, get things off the ground. But of course, in a later stage, you have to uh, expand the number of people involved and actors and also to uh, well hope that all these uh, bottom up initiative also puts pressure on the government to really take action as well, because for acceleration, it's really necessary to have also an active government. Last slide, please. Um, I uh, talked already about the uh, hubs. In, in my view, these hubs are perfect examples of uh, platforms where transition brokers can uh, uh, orchestrate processes of change towards um, a circular economy. They can help create the system change from a linear to a circular economy from a neutral position. Most of the time, the problem with these kind of transitions is that people uh, are all have their vested interest and that it's hard to overcome all these uh, conflicts of interest. And as a neutral actor, you can really try to bring all these people together and line them up in, in the direction that uh, is needed. So transition brokers can focus on building and upscaling qualitatively high value and scalable circular initiatives that front runners want to take. And in individual actors can often not realize, uh, for instance, in company, such enormous changes themselves. So that they need others to, uh, with whom they need to cooperate, other partners, to make the system change. And uh, transition brokers can really play an important role in that process. And the hubs are perfectly um, uh, capable of doing that. So the role uh, you can then fulfill as a transition broker is to help create the necessary preconditions for the change, to align the partners and make sure that impactful circular initiatives can jointly be taken. Well, um, if I say this, it means that 
in uh, uh, managing the governance, you, and that's my last sentence, you need to look at where are your main, um, well, uh, focuses and uh, where can you uh, really make a change? Where are the windows of opportunity and the avenues that you can choose in your particular country to start, to build, to accelerate, and finally, of course, after 20 years, uh, to mainstream all the initiative to a circular economy. I hope this is helpful and I'm, I love to talk about these results and this is just a, sh a snapshot of what I, uh, uh, well, could collect with all your brains. And I will make sure that the report will be sent to you uh, in, uh, uh, well, in a month or two, um, because uh, it is, of course, nicer to see the whole uh, study and not just a snapshot. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Kramer. It was uh, really insightful and we are all looking forward now to the questions that are already appearing in the chat box. So uh, I would propose the following regarding the program we have uh, co-designed today. That uh, first we take now uh, the opportunity really to answer the question that appeared like the first front runner is there in the chat box. And then we will go to the uh, very exciting part of introduction of the circular economy hubs and their achievements. Then we will ask you and Kilian as well for the feedback. And then we will go in the second round of the members of the hubs and do the final conclusions. So uh, the first question here is, what is the role of individuals in this type of network? I think we need to think of individuals not as passive consumers, uh, but as active users and partners in change. So this is the question I need uh, the glasses to see. Yeah, Ida Haldern Tu, I cannot pronounce the name, uh, but hopefully, yes, uh, the question is important here. Yeah, please, can, can you focus on that? What is the role of individuals in this type of networks? Well, what I do myself in, in these kind of processes of change, I focus on the coalition of the willing, the people that clearly show that they feel the urgency to move. If you try to involve everybody in the beginning, it becomes really difficult to get a, a, a kind of initiative off the ground. And I first like to have clear circular uh, initiatives um, implemented and show their merits before I in, uh, involve a, a, a bigger group of people. But the individuals in these uh, circular initiatives, the, the first movers, are really important because they are my ears uh, and eyes for what is necessary to really make the change. Thank you very much for this answer, because really the first movers, very important uh, uh, important actors on this journey, as well as you said, not to start with uh, that focus is needed, not to get lost really into many initiatives. So uh, now we will jump into the first part of introduction of those front runners that we have in our leadership group on network governance and circular economy hubs. And I would like to invite the following speakers to get ready for a very short pitching session, because each of them will have really five minutes to tell us what is their impact on the ground. So with us, uh, there are Marlene Weber from France, Laura Kutaya from Italy, Dan Klinch from Romania and Sarah Miller from Ireland. We will start with Marlene Weber, the influence of the hub on the political and legislative level in France. Marlene, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lady. Uh, I will just share my screen up. OK, can you see it? It's okay. Yes, we can so, see. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm Marlene Weber, so I'm the head of legal and European affairs at the National Institute for Circular Economy in France. So, the INEC is a think tank, so it's a multi stakeholder association 
composed of 200 members, uh, which are companies, NGOs, local authorities and schools. And our role is to promote the circular economy and uh, accelerate its development by several levels as uh, improve the state of knowledge in the circular economy and promote good practices uh, we published indeed more than 60 studies available on our website and we are working on programs with firms and local authorities uh, as on sim uh, industrial symbiosis or on circular procurement. And we also have an international platform called circulareconomy.org um, which references all good practices in France and in some other countries. Uh, we are also working on organizing the public debates uh, around the circular economy to make the subject known to companies and various economic actors and citizens. And so the topic has really taken on great importance in the public debate in recent years in France, uh, when our president, uh, François-Michel Lambert, uh, who is elected to the French parliament, uh, raised the subject at the National Assembly in 2013, when the INEC was created. And at this time, nobody knew about circular economy uh, and the other deputies loved uh, a little about it. And now all elected um, officials say circular economy in every sentence. And we had a ministry for the circular economy. Uh, we have position taken by many elected officials and many new regulatory texts. And this is uh, also what we are working on. So the Institute has become the French reference uh, and the main partner of the public authorities. Uh, and our goal is to promote, to influence the standards around circular economy. So in 2015, we pushed to include a full circular economy title uh, in the energy transition law, uh, title under which the development of a national uh, strategy on the circular economy was planned. And in 2018, we actively participated in this elaboration of this circular economy uh, national roadmap as on extended the producer responsibility reform. And then finally, we had an entire project bill an anti-waste law on circular economy. As for the roadmap, we participated a lot in ministerial working groups on the development of the project and with the work with the legislative power afterwards by meeting the deputies, by carrying out hearings with them and by proposing uh, amendments and many of which have been adopted. Uh, for example, uh, the ban on the destruction of new and unsold goods, like washing machine or computer, for example, and the fact that producers had to pay uh, VAT to give away these new and unsold goods, uh, which was not the case when they destroyed them, of course, so it was a, a big problem in France. And fortunately, this is never over. And we had last month a climate bill and a bill on territories. And now it's discussed the finance law and we're working on whether the budgetary and fiscal framework is favorable or not for a circular economy. We make some proposals to the French parliament and for the first time in the world, the France has published a green budget, uh, a scan of all income and expenditure of the country with regard to the environmental impact. So to finish, here are some examples of our uh, studies. Uh, if I uh, can get yeah, share the slide. Uh, yeah, here are some examples of our public and private members. Uh, we are trying to represent all sectors and all type of structures to be a representative of society, uh, small and bigger members. And you can find here uh, some of our study that you can find on our website. Lately, we published a study on circular industry with the help of 60 firms on how the industry can become circular to trigger an industry shift to the circular economy and facilitate the scaling up. And we also published an, an, an analysis of the circular economy bill, article by article and a study on the European Circular Economy Networks uh, that you can find uh, all the networks present today and which completes the work of uh, uh, 
Professor Jacqueline Kramer. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Marlene. Thank you twice. One big applause for being uh, super efficient and effective with time. Thank you so much. And okay. what we have learned from you is as well um, is how uh, what Professor Kramer uh, stressed this um, collaboration between public and network governments uh, looks in practice. I guess that you are walking the talk really and we will refer to that later on. Thank you a lot. And we are moving now to Italy. There is another uh, great platform performing. So Laura, please, uh, the floor is yours and we are eager to hear about your activities and your impact on the ground, please. Yes, Ladeia, uh, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to present uh, very quickly the EHS experience, uh, the Italian Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform was launched in uh, May 2018 by Enea and uh, for collecting and boosting, uh, collecting experience on circular economy in Italy and boosting so the, the so-called the Italian way for the circular economy. Uh, we started uh, at that time with about 20 uh, signees and up to now we have more than 1 135 at the moment are 43 organizations I need for the for the for the charter for the circular economy and now we are we have uh, more than 260 organizations participating in the um, platform and about 800 experts uh, collaborating in the working groups we are um, stakeholders from uh, uh, association and um, uh, SMIS, uh, citizen third sector, uh, institution, universities and research. Um, from the beginning, from the beginning, our uh, way of work was in uh, working groups, uh, where uh, experts are taking part to produce uh, um, policy paper, uh, workshops and uh, other uh, different tools for um, improving the circular economy uh, experience and also the knowledge. Uh, now we are working together with uh, the working groups of HSP in a, in a sort of parallel way. Uh, the, last, the last year uh, each has produced uh, a sort of agenda for the circular economy with uh, some priorities uh, for the Italian government. The, these priorities are uh, subdivided in uh, context, uh, tools uh, and actions. Some of them, such as, for example, governance, are being taken now from the Italian document uh, for the strategy for the circular economy, which is uh, now under consultation from the Ministry of uh, Ecological Transition in Italy. And, uh, uh, some of our uh, conclusion are also present in this document. Uh, we think that our experience in Italy uh, is useful in order to improve and to collect all the initiatives that are running in Italy, but not only, uh, but it's also useful to, be, to have some uh, comparison with the European uh, experience. Uh, and now uh, each of can uh, uh, provide some useful insights, some useful comments to the Italian strategy for the circular economy, which is now under consultation. Um, at the same time, another, another uh, objective of our um, uh, platform is collect good practices. At the moment, there are more or less uh, 170 uh, good practices collected from uh, different uh, um, circular economy uh, stage and different sectors. Some of them are also uh, shared with HS platform and so the, I, I think that also the role of uh, AB for circular economy is to 
uh, spread the initiative of the European Circular Economy platform and also to, to make the circular economy arrive to, to different uh, stakeholders uh, which are not so useful to, 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 to collaborate with the uh, European institution and with European initiatives. Uh, this our, is our, our uh, link for consulting and cooperate with us. Thank you very much for, for this opportunity. Thank you and big applause, uh, Laura. Amazing. And uh, I don't know how the others feel, but uh, wh what you do, and I, I put the question there because this is more than one government can do. So <laughs> it's amazing uh, what, what you uh, have achieved as well as what has been achieved in France. So I'm really inviting you to set the questions here in the chat box because uh, there is so much to be exchanged and learned from each other. Uh, we have to go on now and uh, Dan Klinch is someone who is coming from Romania and now after two impressive presentations of the two hubs that have been working for quite some time and the achievements that are amazing, we have a newcomer and a brave, uh, not only a brave man, but a brave team behind. So please share your story because uh, as I understood, this is one of your first presentations of the platform you have established. Please, Dan. Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity to present our platform. I don't know if you hear me well, it's OK. Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Yes, I will put uh, up my presentation now. This is my presentation and. Yes, we can see it if you can make and, it larger. And the, and the magic F. And yeah, the magic F. F and the doctor and the clinic, everything. For yes, and the clinic. My name is uh, almost the same pronunciation as clinic. So I will try to beat uh, Marlene Weber in uh, shortness of uh, my presentation. I think our platform brings nothing new um, after uh, all the presentation that you, you made. Uh, we create our institute in the first time. Let uh, present us in a few words. Our institute, the Institute for Research in Circular Economy and Environment, Ernest Lupin, it functions like a think tank that brings together initiatives about the circular economy and implementation of env env environmental protection. Since, since this year, we, our institute established the ROSESP, the ROCSP platform. This platform is integrated in the ECSP model and aims to create a virtual community to facilitate the exchange of all, on all levels between stakeholders on issues specific to, the res, to this research field. You have all the information on the screen and in some kind of way our model replicates your preoccupation or the preoccupation of all the other platforms. So we consider at this point we don't bring uh, nothing new. I must point in uh, a few words that uh, we try to establish not only um, linking, uh, networking be between stakeholders, but even to promote our preoccupation, uh, the Romanian preoccupation into the European uh, uh, field of uh, research. We function also uh, on our platform, functions also on uh, the, uh, the work group uh, networking. We have uh, eight uh, work groups. You, you have uh, them on uh, screen. Uh, nothing new even here. We try to uh, identify all the problems that uh, appear in the society uh, related to circular economy, but not also on uh, the circular economy, but in the field of creating and changing the behavior of the society um, approaching to this um, to this uh, kind of model. Uh, the stakeholders uh, of the platforms are invited to join uh, one work group of perhaps uh, more work groups and participate with the activity or participate in, in discussion and debates uh, to construct uh, uh, the, I don't know, to construct uh, the problematic that we need to, to discover. 
I think uh, what is um, interesting in our platform and in our activity is that uh, we try to overlap uh, the social economy uh, upon those two layers that we are used with, the, the one about the circular economy and the other about the, uh, constructing a hub, constructing a community. And this uh, layer that we overlap it is the social uh, economy because uh, we create uh, the platform under a project uh, financed by uh, European uh, funds. The project name is ASSIST. And uh, the, the aim of the projects is to create uh, social enterprises that have the, the circular economy as a mandatory component of their activity. We consider this kind of combination a very interesting way of uh, create a um, uh, uh, circular economy uh, behavior in, in the economic uh, way to, to manage uh, the activity of every enterprise. We put them together, we make them uh, change their information, we make them thinking not as social entrepreneurs, but also as circular economy uh, implementers in, uh, in um, the field. The platform helped them uh, to uh, have uh, access to up-to-date uh, leg legislation, uh, also to good practices from all around the world, all around Europe, uh, but the platform also promote their work, promote their businesses, and in some kind of way we construct the platform as in the same time a way to promote the benefits and the needs of the circular economy, but in the same time to promote a good uh, um, example or good series of uh, uh, know-how in how to conduct a social economic uh, uh, institution or an enterprise. In, it's a challenge. We are only the beginning of uh, construction this platform. We have also uh, um, a bunch of institutions and a bunch of organization came from uh, the financing, came from the economic environment, and in the same time from the NGOs uh, um, field. And we try to uh, 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 create teams in every work group. The barriers that we are clashed to in this uh, first uh, days of, I, I don't know, first month of uh, um, activity is that we, in some kind of way, uh, find uh, um, hard to uh, create motivation to uh, uh, have an, uh, um, uh, an activity in, in these uh, work groups. We think that we uh, try to construct models of uh, um, success, models of success in, uh, in, uh, generated by this uh, kind of community working and we try to, um, this is our work now, we try to uh, create uh, interest uh, in, uh, in these uh, work uh, groups. Thank you for your uh, attention. This was my short presentation. Thank you very much and congratulations on what you have achieved. And uh, uh, for me, it was uh, particularly interesting how you integrated the social aspects and social entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs uh, by creating new jobs uh, in this field. So a lot to be learned from you as well. And in the chat box, you already have the questions done. Thank you. And we are moving now to uh, Sarah Miller to see how in Ireland circular economy is progressing and uh, they have a unique uh, model mm -hmm. as well uh, regarding uh, the way they are financed. So Sarah, we are curious to hear your story. Thanks, Lodea. Can you see my slides okay and hear me okay? Everything uh, is perfect. Thanks. Perfect. So thank you very much. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, circular economy progress here in Ireland and our work at the Rediscovery Centre as a circular economy hub and the National Centre for the Circular Economy in Ireland. I'm also going to talk, as Lydia said, about our collaborative work with government agencies and municipalities, but I'm going to start with a quick update on national policy. Um, so any Irish um, Participants will be very aware of this, but since 2020, we now have in place a waste action plan for a circular economy. We have a circular economy unit established within government. 
We have a draft high level all of government circular economy strategy and we have a reconfigured national waste prevention program with a renewed focus on the circular economy. And of relevance, the government has also appointed a Minister of State with responsibility for the circular economy here in Ireland. The extent to which the Irish government will be able to affect the transition to the circular economy, however, is dependent on legislative changes and they'll be made possible through the circular economy bill. And that's currently going through pre-legislative scrutiny and we're expected um, that that will be enacted then thereafter. So as you can see, there's significant progress in circular economy here and circular economy policy over the past 12 months. In practice, there's a significant circular economy activity and support across public, private and third sector in Ireland with national organisations like the Community Resource Network of Ireland and Circulera, a national circular economy manufacturing platform supporting this transition. There's also a very strong bioeconomy in Ireland and an active circular economy research community. There is, however, a body of work anticipated in the circular economy strategy to agree a common framework for the implementation and monitoring of the circular economy in Ireland. And we're delighted to participate in this conversation today to discuss the role of network governance and circular economy hubs in the circular transition. So to talk a little bit about our work, um, we were very much involved in demonstrating and communicating circular economy opportunities. In developing demonstration interventions, we set out to create a circular economy centre of excellence. And here we worked with Dublin City Council and the Government of Ireland with match funding provided under the EU LIFE programme to create a physical circular economy hub from a disused building. Employing reuse and reconstruction, we created the building as an educational tool and we incorporated biological and technical closed loops to demonstrate natural and sustainable materials and operating systems. Within the centre itself, reuse social enterprises create beautiful homeware and fashion, restore furniture, rebuild bicycles and reuse and redistribute paint. This type of enterprise activity is often delivered through service level agreements with local authority recycling centres. This is a real win-win partnership. The local authority reduces the amount of waste generated at the centres and the social, the social enterprise benefits financially from the reuse contract and from access to materials for reuse and resale. The centre's EcoStore also provides a retail platform for social enterprises and for eco designers from across Ireland to sell their wares. And hand in hand with this demonstration is the research component of our work, demonstrating circular economy principles, and models and providing evidence-based research to accelerate circularity and support growth. Through the National Circular Economy Academy, we also work with social enterprises and help them to adopt circular economy principles and models. So a key role of the centre obviously is delivering education and raising awareness of the circular economy. We have formal curriculum linked education programmes we also provide support for curriculum development and teacher CPD. We have recently received funding through the Science Foundation Ireland and the Department of Education to scale and to grow that offering on a national basis. We have for non-formal vocational training and that's delivered through our social enterprises and through our national networks. And funding for those labour activation programmes is provided by the Department of Rural and Community Development and also the Department of Social Protection here in Ireland. Public engagement obviously takes many forms. We have a strong circular economy communications programme delivering multi-channel campaigns. We also provide knowledge and information through digital platforms, websites, newsletters, and where possible in person uh, with targeted conversations, interactive exhibitions, innovation showcases, workshops, and events. These campaigns are also often delivered in partnership with government agencies, regional and local authorities. And those collaborations provide them with access to active citizen engagement channels, channels and also to our circular economy networks. So the work of the centre is very much enabled by our vast network through collaborations and partnerships. For example, in 2004, we started as a small community based NGO. Our work was delivered through a strategic partnership with Dublin City Council on the back of a, of a major urban regeneration programme. More recently, in 2018, we signed a three-year strategic partnership with the Environmental Protection Agency here in Ireland. 
And this really enabled a co-design approach to the national reach of the rediscovery centres, the national centre for the circular economy, and for the EPA's national waste prevention programme. Prior to that, most partnerships were renegotiated on an annual basis, but this multi-annual partnership with the EPA has provided the opportunity for longer term strategic thinking and has also resulted in increased and expanded impact far beyond the partnership ambitions. The Rediscovery Centre is essentially a bottom-up circular economy organisation, but through developing partnerships and projects with government agencies, municipalities, academic institutions, businesses and civil society organisations, we have created a circular economy hub that has been supporting and accelerating circular economy innovation and positive behaviour change for almost 17 years. Our work in capacity building through collaboration networks, committees, groups and platforms such as this European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform is key to the success of the Centre as a Circular Economy Hub. And I would like to thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to participate in the platform and I really look forward to the rest of the discussion today. Thank you. Thanks a lot and another great and inspirational uh, example of that how collaborations happened and even uh, on that how finances can be found uh, and the questions are already in the box. So here I'm wrapping up this first part asking Frick to invite Professor Kramer to give reflections and after her uh, we will invite also Kilian who is still with us uh, to reflect on the lessons learned, actually, not only case studies heard. Please go on. Thank you so much, Lade, and thank you to all the speakers. That's so wonderful and uh, gives me a warm heart. So we have seen four different realities from four parts uh, of Europe, France, Italy, Romania and Ireland. And of course, we're very curious what, uh, what Jacqueline is thinking about these four realities. If she thinks about, uh, she mentioned the level of public government, the involvement of actors, and of course, the receptivity of network governance. Uh, uh, what would you, what would you, how would you rate those four countries and hubs uh, related to your four recommended action areas? Uh, what are the questions which are popping up listening to their stories, Jacqueline? Well, first of all, thank you all for the very uh, interesting presentations and I was really enthusiastic to hear that you all have a very well-functioning stakeholder platform uh, and uh, you use that in the first place as a think tank. Um, but many of you also said, and I really like that, that you also use that platform to formulate uh, proposals uh, about policies and uh, instruments uh, for, C, uh, for circular economy implementation. And you ask the government, please act upon that. I think that it is a very strong point because you uh, represent uh, bottom up a lot of people that, uh, well, hopefully uh, the uh, government, uh, uh, well, is willing to, uh, to respond to. And secondly, what I also like is that you all um, pay a lot of attention to information, knowledge uh, sharing uh, in order to distribute all the, the experience that are already there. Um, and uh, in that way, you also show that you want to um, be clear about the possibilities and the good practices. And that motivates people to really join uh, your platform. So all these things I really like and uh, also the clear examples of demonstration projects that show that it's not only uh, feasible uh, and uh, interesting uh, in view of the environmental uh, gains, but also uh, it's important to show the economic benefits. So in that sense, uh, all of you are really working on, on building the platform. My puzzle is a little bit um, how you can come from giving nice good practices to taking up these practices and scaling them in such a way that they become, uh, in the end, 
the mainstream uh, of practices. And uh, the, the work uh, I do in the Netherlands is particularly related, how can we make sure that all these very nice uh, innovations uh, really uh, can flourish by uh, orchestrating processes of change. And most of the time, uh, the, the companies can't make that choice, uh, that, that's, uh, that change uh, alone. They need other partners to really scale up. And uh, I think that uh, it is important to also uh, have a dialogue, uh, not only today, but in the future, how we can manage to use uh, the, the hubs, the plat platforms, together, for instance, with, with these social en enterprises mentioned uh, uh, by Romania, uh, to really, um, well, uh, accelerate the circular economy. Otherwise, it, be, it, it remains niche while we want to become mainstream. <laughs> Do you have a specific question to one of the four speakers uh, that that you were really intrigued on how would that work there, listening to their stories? Well, uh, I like to ask Sarah. Uh, I, I, we met in Ireland years ago when you started uh, circular economy, uh, uh, and uh, you made a lot of progress. And I'm I'm curious to know uh, to know whether the, the things that I say about building coalitions to get really things in, uh, done in practice and scaling up, whether you are able to do that and what kind of problems you have. Yeah, um, I, I think we all recognize that the collaboration is, is really key, I suppose, for any hub to exist within a, in a country. There's so many people uh, working on the circular economy in Ireland. And what we try to do is, is work with all of the various networks and um, practitioners, I suppose, to see if we can be greater than the sum of our parts. Um, what challenges, I suppose, um, finance has always has been a concern, um, mainly in the past. To be honest, we've seen a lot of progress in recent years here um, with the development of the new waste action plan for a circular economy and the circular economy strategy. There are supports. Um, we thought, I suppose, about different ways to scale our operations. And the model that we have decided upon is through working with other social enterprises and supporting them within their own community um, to, to develop their own social enterprises or their own circular economy hubs and activities. Um, we feel that that's the best approach for, um, for us here in Ireland. And that also has to be done, in, obviously, in collaboration with local authorities and municipalities and with the government of Ireland. Yeah, the process of orchestrating, that's quite a, a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But, you know, I think in Ireland we are lucky in that this sector is relatively small, maybe in comparison to other countries. You know, we're, we're quite a, um, a well-connected community within the circular economy. So perhaps it's easier in Ireland in, the, in that it is smaller. And network governance is also quite familiar to you, as I remember. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Jacqueline. I, I have to, to move to Ladea again because I see lots of activity in the chat. Uh, uh, what are the most interesting questions popping up? Well, they're all interesting. Of course, which one? Yeah, would you... A lot of questions popping up, and I would like to use the opportunity to uh, to use the Joker that is Kilian to join us in the discussion as well. And here we have one interesting question: uh, like transition to circular economy is a systemic one, therefore it's cross sectorial. Question: How do you ensure the policy coherence and uh, of all the actions and activities. What role do hubs play in this? Maybe, Kilian, based on what you have heard, and because you've been on the other side as well, working on the ground, now being uh, very much engaged in all this uh, network governance and public governance, what would your answer be? And, of course, further on the reflections on the stories heard. Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, I guess I mean, we've seen this is a huge area, isn't it? And it, it's complicated, but it's it's great that we're at this point of the discussion in trying to see what what can we do to amplify things, to move things on to the, the next level. Um, 
and and indeed to try and scale up as we say i think as well as scaling up we need to think about replication that it doesn't necessarily have to be um one thing getting bigger and bigger but just uh, rep lots of replication can also achieve that scaling up and we shouldn't just think about scaling up as as um as one entity growing and growing but rather creating these networks like like we're discussing and i think that's what's what struck me about the the systemic uh, nature of this and i very much like the fact that jacqueline at the start mentioned um, had this diagram of of how the networks operate and work and it struck me that it's very much um uh like an ecosystem approach. It's a, the, the network is more like how ecosystems work in nature. As we know, we get all our best uh, designs, all our best eco design, our best circular economy examples from natural systems that function in a in a way that there is no waste, where everything has a, a purpose and gets fed back, fed back into the system again in in whatever manner. Um, and I think in that sense, we can we can replicate a structure from within nature, which is that ecosystem structure um, uh, to achieve that systemic change. So instead of focusing on um, on on simple hierarchies, hierarchical structures that that exist within ecosystems, but do, don't define the overall systemic structure, uh, we can be successful. I think in, in Jane, the different socio-cultural uh, challenges by looking at this ecosystem type approach. But as a, an overall observation to everything that's come in in the chat and from Marlene and Laura and Dan and Sarah, I think it, it constantly goes back to two things. One, finding the the specific examples that work and can be levers. Uh, Marlene mentioned in the chat the EPR systems. They have over 20, 26, I think, of them in, in France, as well as focusing on, on green public procurement, which is also happening to an extent in Ireland. And Laura and Dan both talked about like the strength of, of, of the networks and the need to identify where the obstacles are. And it seems to continually come back to finances to go to the next stage uh, for information to be available across the ecosystem, across the network of stakeholders, um, for information to be available to them, how to access the money that is, is set aside to create this transition. I think it's something we need to do at an EU level and that we also need to do at a member state level. So maybe that's part of where the direction that we need to start going in um, with the with or the platforms and, and the different hubs to link to where the funding is available and where those opportunities are. Thank you very much, Killian, for that. I, I think it was a nice wrap up of this first uh, section and of this first presentations. And uh, as you said, yes, there is a lot of knowledge, good practices that can be replicated, but often funding and finding uh, the money is an issue. So hopefully now with all this money available within green recovery funds, uh, we will manage to step together and get more information also from those who can provide this information, how on the ground, uh, uh, how to assure this access on the ground. So thank you very much, Kilian. I know that you have to leave now, but uh, we will stay here with uh, others and with Professor Kramer as well for this second round. And in the second round, we are focusing now more on the power of networks. So what is now, well, now we have heard the stories of hubs and of their impact, and now we will dive into the network um, and networks and their power. So we have Arthur Ten Velde from Ecopreneur, Cynthia Reynolds from uh, Circular Regions, then two, uh, two amazing ladies, not from EU. One is Catherine Barth from Nordic Circular Hotspot, and the other one is Beatrice Luz coming from Brazil, so Latin America is with us as well. But who else than Arthur Ten Volde can open the floor for this discussion? So Arthur, please jump in and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ladea, and also thank uh, the organizers and ESES for the opportunity to speak here on behalf of Ecopreneur. I will now try to share my screen. Let me see, that should be this one. And then I want to present it. Do you now see my screen? Yes, we can see the screen and we can hear you perfectly well. OK, so my name is Artur Tenwolde. I'm the executive director of uh, the European Sustainable Business Federation, Ecopreneur.eu. 
and ecopreneur is uh, depicted a bit here. It is the political voice of sustainable businesses in Europe with our seven national member organizations that are in the middle, like BMW, Entreprendre Vert, and five others from different member states. We represent about 2,900 small and medium sized enterprises and about 100 larger enterprises. And the countries are Germany, France, Austria, the Netherlands, Belgium, Sweden, and Estonia. And all these companies, all these SMEs and large companies are dedicated to delivering sustainable products and services. And the logos that you see here on the screen of the, all the companies are so they are not just a ship, snapshot, sorry. Um, and the five at the bottom, by the way, they are uh, closely connected to us like Tarket and Wernhout Metz because they form the advocacy group and they directly work with on, on position papers. And we are the only cross-sectoral business organization at the EU level committed to bold sustainability policies. And our goal is to support green enterprises with projects and advocacy, mostly advocacy, for bold EU policies that accelerate the transition to a sustainable economy. Um, we also have written reports in 2019. We gave circularity update with what is going on in all the member states. Most of it is still very actual. Um, and sorry, this is not what I wanted to show you. I wanted to do this. Um, and in 2021, we just published, I cannot show it because you're seeing the screen, but we just published a report why sustainable SMEs hold the key to the circular economy. Um, so now what I wanted to talk with you about is the example in the Netherlands. So this is managed actually by MVO Nederland, uh, our Dutch member organization. Um, and this is actually a slide of MVO Nederland, which shows a brief history and that I was also myself a part of. Um, in 2013, uh, circular economy took off in the Netherlands with several organizations starting working on it. And this evolved into something called uh, Nederland Circular. Um, and you see at the bottom that also two other organizations that uh, that you may know, Circo and Holland Circular Hotspots, became um, yeah, separate entities. And then two years later, about yeah, more than 200 organizations signed a national resources accord. And that is very uh, important because it provided the basis for um, the the action and also for the mem for the support from the government to uh, fund all the activities to help SMEs and large companies. Uh, so you see at the bottom that there was the launch of a government-wide program. Um, there was also a roadmap uh, published. Um, and so the broad support from the Dutch stakeholders that was actually built up since 2013, including also large companies such as DSM and Philips, uh, and also uh, the Groene Zaak, which was the predecessor of MVU Nederland, uh, ministries, um, and also very important, VNO NCW, uh, NCW, you see it at the right corner, that is the Confederation of Industries. And their support has also now led to the, uh, what we call the Versnellingshuis or the Acceleration House. Um, by the way, maybe one step back, um, uh, Ecopreneur recommends the launching of such hubs and also of something like an acceleration house in all member states. Um, and that's also why this example is, uh, I think, extra important. Um, and the, um, the advocacy to launch these hubs was um, supported by the European Parliament in 2020. Uh, and uh, the, the, the European Circular Economy Action Plan is supposed to be carried out in that way. Um, and what are we? Uh, what do we think is a hub? Um, it is a pub. Uh, it is a public-private partnership, like you just saw in, in different examples. Also, it can be regional or national. And um, since it's so important to reach the SMEs, it's very, very important entrepreneur things that there should be acceleration hubs and, and circularity hubs in all the regions of Europe. And these should act as one stop shops, helping SMEs, larger companies and municipalities on how to implement circular models. Um, so. Let me see. I want also to men mention to you what are the results for the Versnellingshuis, the acceleration house in 2020 so far. Well, first of all, most entrepreneurs are indeed looking for finance, 
they're looking for partners or they're looking for knowledge. And the uh, lack of access to finance is uh, coming back and again and again. Uh, and knowledge, yeah, uh, complexity of circular design and designing the whole value chain is also one of the key issues for uh, SMEs where they find that they need help. Um, and in the last year, this year, I mean, so far, uh, 269 entrepreneurs were supported via online matches, case managers, or a tailor-made approach. Also, the Fresnelling House itself organized uh, two round tables. Um, but I want to uh, emphasize that it is an acceleration house, so it, it, it is a network coordinator, and most actions towards enterprises are performed by the other organizations in the network. And this network is rapidly growing. So, so far, 120 potential uh, collaboration partners in the Netherlands have been identified and 77 collaboration agreements have been signed, including with Circo, which is offering uh, trainings to SMEs on circular design. I also do this myself sometimes. Uh, and the Holland Circular Hotspot, which is providing the international uh, network function. And Art, many here yeah. I am the bad girl. Yes. <laughs> Time is running out. <laughs> yeah, Please. okay. Let me let me conclude with the, my last slide. So uh, the entrepreneur vision of circularity hubs in all EU regions can be found on our website. And basically, we promote that the European Commission funds the the um, the foundation or the um, the the growth uh, of um, these uh, hubs with four functions that were also mentioned by the Anna MacArthur Foundation. Um, the first is collaboration and advocacy platforms. The second is education, information and awareness. The third is business support and tools. And the fourth, collaboration at the EU level. I hope this has been of help for you. Thank you. Absolutely, Arthur. Thank you so much for uh, everything you have shared. And this is great intro also into the next presentation by Cynthia Reynolds, Circular Regions, because you mentioned what were the outcomes of the survey you did and knowledge is there and uh, the sharing of best practices and money, money, of course. But Cynthia has something what uh, can be considered as a magic mapping tool. Cynthia, please. Thank you for having me. Is everyone able to see my screen right now? Yes, it is very good. Yeah, Perfect. we can see. Um, circular regions. We work at bridging top down and bottom up circular economy through place based solutions that connect urban and rural communities, multi stakeholder, cross sector. We're mission oriented and we're data driven. And we're developing a suite of tools that can help mission oriented organizations in the circular economy and related arenas, such as the bioeconomy, regenerative economy, carbon neutrality, to catalog, categorize, contextualize, and connect their data and information resources and connect them to the wider community. And we aim to cast the net wide to enable interoperability with other value aligned initiatives, systems, tools, and compatibility for a shared intelligence. Right now, we're, we're hearing a lot about all the different stakeholders across sectors and, and regions looking at mapping best practice. Uh, the discussion of best practice versus good practice is another one. But today, I would like to discuss best practice mapping. How can we connect together via new standards to gather data that can help us all? Right now, all of the stakeholders who are gathering information are developing websites, databases, information, uh, often PDF reports, and this data is context bound. We aren't able to work with that data and make it dynamic. We've seen clearly that best practice can be related to circular business models, to policies and economic incentives, educational and behavioral shift resources. And these multiple static databases lead to inefficiencies. And if anyone knows anything about the circular economy, we need to mutualize our resources and use them optimally. What we need to do is link across these websites and use semantic web standards. I won't have time today to go into that, but I welcome anyone to contact me to find out more information about the data sets themselves. When we look at the data, we need to start looking at compatibility not only with each other's hubs and networks, but also with best in class frameworks, such as the Sustainable Development Goals, 
the European Environment Agency's Framework for Enabling Circular Business Models in Europe, and integrating new frameworks, such as the societal readiness levels, so we can start getting rid of a lot of the greenwashing that's happening, to identify a societal readiness level of one where we have an idea, right up to level nine where it's integrated into society. Not only do we have to have this as compatible, we also have to be able to connect this internationally. And that means the development of a multilingual thesaurus based on these standards. And this will help us break down the cultural and linguistic barriers that are some of the biggest hurdles that we have. What this will do is enable interoperability of this data, empowering networks of communities with a shared intelligence. And this can lead to machine understandable data via the semantic web. So what this new standard would mean is that every hub, city, hotspot, region, scan, project, network, or cluster can start sharing our data via these new standards and develop a shared intelligence. So please consider this a call to action to contact me to join this project and look at how you can integrate these data sets into your best practice mapping. Thank you. Wow, Cynthia, it was so powerful and uh, I believe that uh, each of us is now, wow, <laughs> why am I not there yet? So uh, great invitation uh, and uh, empowerment of uh, everyone and of the work that is happening on the ground. Thanks a lot. And we will move now to another uh, circular lady. So Catherine Barth, Nordic countries, and we have heard now about the societal readiness level and about the culture and uh, language barriers. So you are uh, there in the epicenter of Nordic circular hotspot where all these barriers are present, but I know that there are also solutions. Please uh, let us know how what is happening in the Nordic countries. Thank you so much, Ladea. Thank you all. And I will just uh, be very aware that it was when Arthur uh, uh, the Tenfold showed the map of the European uh, circularity. I don't know if anyone you noticed, but up far left, there was just a white spot. So the European and EU approach to circularity, then the Norway was missing out. And that was one of the whys, one of the intentions of establishing Nordic circular hotspot. The idea came very much uh, on the date when you, uh, Jacqueline Kramer, uh, welcomed on the, uh, in Peace Palace in Den Haag uh, more than three years ago. And we were specially invited and we met some of our neighboring countries uh, being promoting and uh, trying to push the circularity from bottom up and sideways and not succeeding very much. So being supported by the Nordic Ministry Council, Nordic Innovation, with a slight and but steady support for establishing a new NGO system that has the mission and mandate to collaborate the Nordics. It will bridge uh, the countries who are the EEA, uh, it means non-EU countries and the EU countries in a Nordic mindset. And I will just walk you. This morning I decided not to show you uh, any um, PowerPoints or key notes because I just wanted to show you in our house where we are now. Only two, uh, a couple of weeks ago, this room was filled with 50 people gathering from the Nordics and we were live watching the World Circular Economy Forum from Toronto. It was amazing topics. It was amazing takeaways and we did not make any um, uh, agenda or uh, any speeches. We just invited people to come and speak and meet each other from government and, and officially being personal and people present. This house where we have some kind of the project headquarters where we are uh, establishing and now on the uh, journey to onboard partnerships both globally and Nordic and locally. This used to be an old car machine washing hall and uh, now there it's not a car machine washing hall now it's a house with creatives and uh, it's uh, made for new startups and to put circularity in any kind of thinking and how we learn to do it. This is actually a test house building where we have been testing the first uh, uh, material bank, uh, which is some kind of a Dutch uh, technology approach to the, you know, the construction industry. So we learn by being with you, but also learn by doing. And 
being gathered with the Arctic community in during the World Circular Economy Forum in Canada, it is obvious that if we look on Nordic region from space, from a satellite, and we pinpoint down, we see how big it is, how vulnerable it is, and how unprotected our resource-rich area is. And why do we see the necessity of being a Nordic uh, hub and not a national or local hub? Because if you put uh, people-wise the Nordic population together, it will be about 27 million people. That is equal to Canada. And if you put our economies together, we are the 11th largest economy in the world. But we are aparted by borders and cultures and uh, barriers and silos and silos. So now trying to get on the level where we see how the region it's from Greenland on the Canadian border and into the eastern region of the Baltics and even the new Baltics, Poland is also part of our Nordic mindset. And in a way, how could we now identify stakeholder mapping as Cynthia so eloquently is presenting the need of mapping tools, mapping mindset, connecting skills and connecting abilities and be relevant. So since we are a lagger in a way, but this year Norway got at least its first circular national strategy with no funding. So I, the reason why I decided not to uh, make a presentation, it was actually would be irrelevant when we open our doors, get out of our churches. It's so important to be together where we are here. But the last week I've been speaking with our first onboarding partners. Where is the pain point in the shoe, in the industry, in the government? And we, I understand it's not, it's, it's a very silo oriented public debate. So spending one hour with a very prominent journalist from our main mass stream media this morning, I will share with you. And she asked, can you please, uh, how could I learn from them? Because it's so hard for her to, we are lacking the stories our, uh, our insight and the necessity is uh, losing uh, in the media, on the agendas, in the sort of mass, mass community. So I would share finally uh, the last reflection from, uh, from how can we be relevant um, together and with others. Uh, and a key takeaway, I was, would share reflection with you from Canada. It was how fantastic the World Circular Economy Forum in Canada actually set First Nation and Indigenous culture on the table, really awarding and honoring being, thank you for being present on your earth. And I truly need think that we need people coming from the cultural and the nature knowledge, tacit knowledge, and this can connect us all. It can bring uh, dimensions to a new level. I also uh, see how and the question from the journalist is, would you know anyone if there's a European overview, how the governments actually financed their circular strategies? And this would be for Jacqueline Kramer, probably, or Friek van der Eyck. It would be a lovely, uh, um, uh, relevant knowledge now. Uh, we are getting our national budget tomorrow. So how could we support, together support one of the head journalists providing a an, uh, 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 um, takeout knowing how much funding did the variety of European countries actually put into transitioning by network governance, investing in transition brokers, and how using the system that Jacqueline Kramer actually uh, is setting up. Last and not least, uh, trying to be part of the awakening. This summer I was actually translating a Jacqueline Kramer book to Norwegian because sometimes knowledge is in the mother tongue it is how do we make this understandable? And it was so lovely to share this document in Norwegian. It's lousy, but it really get, got me to that idea because the, this book, this ideation of transition brokership, how do we fund it? How do we make our wings uh, spread uh, so we can fly uh, further together? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Katrin. Yes, and what you said, how to fly together further. A very important message because uh, we cannot do it alone. And indigenous people know that. They always say, if we walk together, we will get there. And there is another lady walking with us in Latin America and showing us the way how to do that in a huge country in Brazil, uncomparable to anything uh, what we have here in Europe. So Beatrice, now not only the floor, but eyes and ears and hearts are yours. Please wrap up it with your story. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ladea. It's a big honor to be here sharing our journey. And like others, I will just um, share my screen and get some insights of our journey here in Brazil. And first of all, I would like to say I was very pleased to see um, Arthur showing the, the, the timeline. Oh, I, oh, here. Of, uh, um, of the Netherlands because uh, the time that I went to the Holland Circular Hotspot in 2016 was the time that I opened up my eyes and started this collaboration with the Netherlands and I met Ladea and later on uh, Catherine and I was able to uh, accelerate my journey here in Brazil. So in beginning of 2020, we launched the Brazilian Circle Economy Hub as a multi-sector ecosystem that aimed to accelerate the circle economy in Brazil. And the point, as everybody said, uh, the aims were to work on the structural changes necessary for the transition, education and practical solutions. And I'm very glad to uh, uh, thank all our 18 members because they are all uh, private organizations and, and research centers that committed to this uh, pre-competitive model and totally industry-led and financed. So the idea and the different uh, approach that we decided to bring to Brazil is to create an ecosystem based on the value chain integration. So we created three different categories of companies. The first one that we called activators, the large organizations that were bringing challenges and, 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 and the providers, the solution providers, they were bringing the solutions and the supporters, the research centers, the innovation centers that together will bring all the necessary intelligence. So we brought up our ecosystem based on true values, uh, bringing trust, ethics and collaboration. And the four areas of work uh, goes around education, engagement, communication solutions. And of course, uh, we value the international knowledge exchange. We learned that uh, there's so many things that uh, we, we can learn from each other. And, and this is key to accelerate the transition. We cannot do it alone. And even though we are in Latin America with different geographic dimension and, and different culture, we can learn a lot uh, because government and industry and the society wants the same thing. So we based our work in building this collaborative projects and creating clusters and providing educational material. So basically how to build truly circular projects. Uh, after the first year of gathering companies and members, we established what we call the three phase and seven step way of building truly circular projects. So the first phase is building the circular mindset, getting the right understanding. We realize that there are different gaps and challenges throughout the value chain, and we cannot uh, work on finding solutions for just one gap. So we need this holistic analysis, the critical thinking, and building trust to be able to get these problems uh, and, and understanding they are interconnected and finding integrated solutions. The second phase, of course, uh, were based on circular governance, connecting these objectives and creating discussions between the members to achieve a collective intelligence. And this was very important and strong to get the companies to really commit and being able to share a, a, a confidential data and get the transparent needed through non-disclosure agreements to be able to reach what we call the real circular solution and the joint project design. So we are now on this stage defining joint action plans and key common priorities. So we have four working groups and here is just a design of two out of the four. And just as an example, one of the working groups, we have five members working for 10 months and we have already facilitated 16 meetings to be able to get this intelligence 
uh, uh, collectively and demonstrating to the members that no one can do it alone. So basically, uh, I really liked uh, Jacqueline Kramer's book and, and all the learning that she brings. And I, I made an analysis bringing this um, infographic that she put together on the barriers to highlight that the Circular Economy Brazilian Hub first uh, focus on the institution and on the organizational uh, needs. Through the four areas of work, we work on the behavior, on the technical, and as a result of this one year of work, we created a new partnership with a 100 year old research center to help us to enforce the government to bring the legislation and achieve innovation funds. So to finalize, I bring three big learnings. You know, the circular mindsets. Companies have understood that technology is only one part of the solution. We need to think systemically. We need to engage different areas of each company internally and interact with stakeholders beyond company boundaries. We also learned that a new economic balance needs to be created. There's a big difference between reverse logistics and reverse supply chain. One is about rounding the linear economy and the other one is about creating something from the beginning, transforming waste into materials. And this has to be done by creating new values, new relationships, and a new economic balance. And finally, as a final point, uh, we realized that we need to create a positive joint agenda. And the circular hubs and the transition workers can really assist in developing this positive jo joint agenda, creating a long-term vision to be able to really break barriers, accelerate change, and achieve scale. So thank you very much. And I'm happy and, and glad to have all our private members together with us sharing our expertise with you. Thank you. One big applause for everything you have achieved. And it resonates so much with uh, what Professor Kramer uh, is uh, teaching us and also empowering us uh, in into which direction to go, Beatrice. So congratulations, really. And it's so nice being part of your journey and knowing uh, how much hard work and how much persistence is needed to get where you are at this very moment. So, Frick, and now uh, you see you have ladies clap here. So we need a man <laughs> to, to conclude this discussion and to lead us to keep takeaways together with Professor Kramer, hopefully. You're right, there were lots of ladies in this group, but I'm so used to that in circular economy. And that's a fantastic field with lots of, let's say, gender neutrality in a way. Well, Jacqueline, of course, I will turn to you very soon. You have seen your home country, the Netherlands. Uh, you have seen the Nordic network. It's so young, but so dynamic. They even translated your book in Norwegian. Uh, we have seen circular region mapping uh, by Cynthia from static to actionable data and the ACE hub in the context of Brazil. It's not a dream, but a reality and actually using your framework. Now, uh, first, a warming up uh, question for you, Jacqueline. Arthur was really promoting acceleration houses in everywhere in Europe. Uh, do you agree that we should have more circular economy hubs in Europe? Oh, for sure. I, I'm in favor of these hubs. That's uh, also um, part of my presentation, uh, the, the relevance of the hubs. And uh, in fact, the acceleration house is a, a hub. But in the Netherlands, we uh, have different hubs. You are also a hub, uh, uh, the Holland Circular Hotspot. And our challenge is to use all the capacity we have in the Netherlands uh, and divide the, the tasks uh, in, that, in such a way that we uh, are uh, as effective as possible together. That's also what Arthur said about uh, the um, uh, role of the network coordinator, uh, what uh, the uh, Acceleration House is in the Netherlands. You are the uh, accelerator outside uh, the Netherlands. Uh, but uh, it, the coordination also means to work with regions and with local government. And so it's, it's a whole network of people that work together all on circular initiatives. So, 
Do you have one? Can I respond very briefly? Uh, because I, I really like the other presentations and I pick uh, three things uh, out of the presentations. In the first place, uh, Cynthia, I, I love your approach uh, on best practice mapping. Uh, you know, my big problem uh, uh, carrying out the international study was that there are no comparable data. Uh, I had to rely on the, the very traditional Eurostat and OECD uh, uh, data sources in order to, to compare countries and ask your own input. But it's, it's very good if we have uh, new indicators to really show what the best practices are, what, what circular economy really means and have the, the right uh, indicators for that and share by uh, digital means the, the, the best practices. And with respect to, to Catherine, uh, you know, I, I love the work you do, great. Uh, you call yourself an NGO and I was puzzled by that because I asked in the uh, interview round, uh, all of you, are NGOs involved? And then we think of the uh, NGOs uh, that are uh, active uh, in mobilizing and um, also criticizing the government. You know, the, the, the traditional NGOs, uh, you are not an NGO in the traditional sense. So I thought, well, you call yourself an NGO, but this, this is not a traditional NGO. And in general, the NGOs in my uh, interview round do not seem to be that active in the whole process of tr the transition to a circular economy. At least they don't express it in that way. And um, I also like to uh, applaud for uh, Beatrice. You know, you have done such a lot of work. Fantastic. And really down to earth, getting things off the ground via uh, very concrete in, uh, projects. Uh, and uh, I learned a lot also from you, uh, Beatrice, in, uh, in, a, in our dialogue about what can you do in your country, knowing that the national, the federal government is not that active, uh, but you have uh, specific um, proactive companies that really are your allies. How can you mobilize th th them in such a way that you can really show with them that uh, the impact is huge if you uh, would scale up all these in initiatives? So uh, great to see the progress made. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, Ladea, is Cillian, uh, still, uh, Killian still with us? Uh, or did he leave already? <laughs> Unfortunately not, he had to leave, so uh, it's up uh, on us to uh, wrap it up in a way and maybe to include some questions as well from uh, from the chat box uh, and there were a lot of ideas as well. So the reflections on the funding, of course, we touched that already. Uh, let me see. Uh, and then Cynthia inspired, yes, some others as well. Uh, is there anything? So if uh -huh, there is new message coming, uh, let's see. Uh -huh. Large companies are uh, yeah, uh, maybe uh, maybe we should touch and wrap up with uh, this topic as well uh, regarding how the hubs uh, are financed because th this has appeared several times. And uh, here is also that uh, there is this problem between private and public partnership. We have heard uh, what Arthur introduced, like a good example of that. But maybe, Professor Kramer, about that, uh, based on the experiences you have now after these interviews, how do you see this uh, maturity on different uh, levels for this pa private-public partnership regarding the hubs? Uh, wh wh what are the lessons there? Well, the lesson uh, I learned is that in some countries, public-private partnerships are hard because the receptivity to network governance and working together is low. Uh, so then you set up, for instance, in cases where the action comes from industry, you set up public, no, not public, but private partnerships first. And then later on, when uh, government gets more interested, then you can expand that to, to the government. But uh, otherwise, you uh, you lose a lot of energy trying to get them involved and they, they are not really eager to, to move. So my advice is look where the action is, where the people that are 
proactively and engaging really make the change with you. And then uh, it's 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 a group that can expand and in, in involve more more and more people. Um, yeah. That gives much more energy than yeah. trying to convince them not to be convinced. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you. I see that Catherine has her uh, head raised. Uh, I can comment on that. Yes, financing. Please, uh, Catherine, if you can uh, join. Uh, we cannot hear you. You have to unmute yourself. That is true. Uh, financing is really a challenge because uh, the value in the linear uh, society is uh, within a system and the value in a circular system is between. Uh, which is uh, hard to sort of uh, gather. We are uh, launching our partnership program and it's a paid partnership. You can either contribute by hours. It means that this uh, attracts uh, and those who doesn't have to the cash. Uh, but then we are also say so it's 5000 euros to be a, 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 a participating partner, which is not very much for big corporates, but just making it very easy and making a very small amount. But we really see the challenge that our aim is to have a a tipping point, a critical mass. So by contributing with ours, it also is has a great value for those who have the knowledge. And we see that if we are able to get like 20 paying partners from every country, now five countries, then maybe we're on the upside uh, uh, part of the business model. So we can have a more self-running finance uh, system. Uh, and then we have what is costing and what we're doing now. Uh, we are doing a huge summit the second year in a row. It, we don't find uh, good business models and we are hard to attract. It's, it's hard to work with sponsorships and partnership in this emerging era. It's interesting that it's not an NGO or what we call it because we are really a hybrid organization across borders and we fall very often in between. We are not like, oh, you're not textile, you're not steel, but we're just Crossover, cross border is confusing. So we believe in our paid partnership uh, 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 program, where those who are dedicated and want to be present with know-how or and of course financial support, we see this might be a valid model uh, to yeah. share a larger group. And uh, Thank yes, thanks a lot, Catherine. And uh, you touched something important as well. Uh, due to these COVID uh, times that uh, do not seem to disappear overnight. Uh, you, you mentioned events and sponsoring and things like that. For us, uh, hubs and networks, it's also one big question. Uh, how to get organized around events like this one today? Uh, because we are overloaded with these Zoom sessions and with everything. So I'm inviting, I'm just using the opportunity now, maybe for reflections afterwards, how to, uh, how to manage our collaboration not only through the events, so what else uh, would uh, help us in uh, this direction? So, Frick, uh, now the final few minutes for the wrap up, and you're always the best with takeaways, wise men leading us towards uh, this transformation. Please. <laughs> Thank you, Ladea. But of course, in the presence of a giant, I tend to be a little bit more modest because I want to give the floor to Jacqueline to give first her takeaways to this particular group that you studied so intensely. Jacqueline, what would be your top three advice to us uh, as your closing words to us? Are you still there, Jacqueline? We cannot see. Well, while Jacqueline is maybe gathering her telephone or restoring her connection, what, what I learned this session is that she said basically uh, uh, what's needed to be successful for us as a hubs is strong public governance and if it's not there we have to work on it involvement uh, of all actors especially industry and of course the receptivity for network governments but the good news is wherever we are uh, the things we're doing we can do it in all areas so uh, um, we will admit Jacqueline again so Jacqueline showed us that let's say the three things I mentioned are very favorable but every situation will have its obstacles and barriers that you need to overcome and she showed us, uh, let's say, four recommended action paths uh, that you can walk to start uh, things moving. Um, Jacqueline, now that you're back with us, um, you have here a unique uh, network of circular economy hubs that you studied so intensely. What would be the three takeaways that you want to give to this group? First is I really want to praise you for the work you do. 
you really make progress and you are eager to do that. Secondly, uh, I think that uh, in every country there are tailor-made approaches needed in order to make progress because the world is not uh, one uh, kind of uh, change. Uh, you always have to make it country specific. And my last point is that uh, I think that the work that I presented is just a snapshot and I really like to have a dialogue after you have read the whole story, what we can do to learn more about each other's work and about the governance in the different countries and not only the 16 I studied but also in those that are involved in the chat now and uh, really shared uh, and, and want to share uh, their experiences as well. So it's just the start of a journey and we are all on an enormous journey, but um, let's hold uh, the, our hands together. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, um, we will love to have continued the discussion with you. We also love to find a nice stage for you that you can present your work to the globe. And we're thinking about a special moment in Dubai in, uh, in January. And I guess we have to continue to do the work uh, that we do to make the network work, the work that we're good in. So all of us have to provide access to finance to the SMEs, uh, like, uh, like Arthur said, sharing uh, best practices from businesses and knowledge institutes, uh, kept building on capacity building, making inventory of barriers and drivers, uh, bringing people together by events, uh, measuring impact, uh, choosing priorities, initiation projects, because we're not a talking clubs, we're actionable clubs and change makers, system change. So uh, let's keep up the good work. From my side, I'm very proud to be part of this network. And the final closing, closing words I give to Ladea. Thank you. I would like to thank you, Professor Kramer, first of all, for not being with us just today, but really to, to be a lighthouse for us, uh, the transition brokers and for uh, the hubs uh, all around the globe. I can say we will definitely contribute to your work as much as we can. Thank you, Frick, for uh, being here uh, and for really um, always putting things on the right place. And I would like to thank, of course, the audience uh, because uh, we have heard a lot, we have read a lot in the chat box. And uh, for me personally, uh, whenever we have events like that, sensing this community of sharing good things and bad things, our peers and our dreams, this is so, so, so valuable. So in this spirit, I would like to conclude and really uh, invite everyone to continue to not stop and not to lose this enthusiasm. It is a bumpy road and it's something what has a long-term uh, impact and uh, we have to be persistent. But uh, let's be driven by joy and uh, by passion and by wisdom. So 